Good morning. We are in our study of the King's Cross, and last week's lesson was entitled The End, and it was about Jesus' trial and his crucifixion. And today we are finishing on the crucifixion and his death and the surrounding events uh, around his death. And so we're going to be singing uh, the Old Rugged Cross. Open wide the window of our spirits, O Lord, and fill us full of light. Open wide the door of our hearts that we may receive and entertain Thee with all our powers of adoration and love. Amen. Um, we're in the section of Mark about the cross and uh, Jesus' purposes for dying on the cross. This lesson is called The End Part Two, and it focuses on the concept of darkness. Um, I want you to try to think for a moment a time when you were in utter darkness. It doesn't happen to us very much in contemporary times because even if our lights are off in our home, there's light, street lights and, and so forth um, so that it's not truly dark. Um, but you may remember a time when there was a total power outage and, and things were really dark at night or um, maybe a time when you uh, someone mentioned the other day that uh, going into a cave, when you go down into a cave, you go into utter darkness. The thing about utter darkness is you can't see what's in front of you, even your hand right in front of you, you can't see. And that causes you to have no sense of direction and you can't tell if anyone, friend or enemy, is around when it is absolutely dark. And that leaves you feeling isolated. Uh, we mentioned in last week's lesson that one of the first exposures to utter darkness concept was in Exodus when one of the plagues right before the um, angel of death 
plague was utter darkness in Egypt for three days. And I can't imagine what utter darkness for three days would do to your sense of being, how confusing that would be. Physical darkness creates a disorientation and the same is true of spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness comes when we turn away from God as our true light and make something else the center of our life. Now the Bible sometimes compares God to the sun. If we think about the sun for a minute, the sun is the source of visual truth because if it weren't for the sun, we wouldn't be able to see anything. The sun allows us to see the reality around us. It is visual truth. And the sun is the source of all earthly life. Uh, nothing could live without the sun. And God, the Bible says, is the source of all truth and life. We find one reference in Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 19 says, Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, hold and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. And then in Psalm 43, we have a reference to truth, God and truth. You are God, my stronghold. Send forth your light and your truth and let them guide me. With God, with a relationship with God, you will have truth and life and you will live in the light. But if you turn away from God, the result is spiritual darkness. And when you are in spiritual darkness, you have problems with loss of direction and feelings of isolation from God and from others. What you experience when you turn from God is fear, anger, pride, ambition, self-pity, just to name a few things that take over when you turn away from God. And the truth is that apart from God, we are all in spiritual darkness. That is our natural state. And we are incapable of changing from this state of glorifying ourself and focusing on ourself, changing to glorifying God, and that's our natural state of glorifying self rather than glorifying God, um, we are incapable of changing that. We are on a path of disintegration, as it were, that, um, but when we have a relationship with God, that will continue even into eternity. In fact, when we don't have a relationship with God, the effects of that follow us into eternity. And so the biblical prophets describe this final day of judgment um, See, this is from Isaiah 13. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its, its evil the wicked for their sins, and I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make people scarcer 
than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. Amos chapter 8 records, The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it? The whole land will rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. And I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. This is the path that human life was on before Jesus. This was what our future held. Jesus' death was the only way to alter that path. And that's why Jesus had to go to the cross. He fell into the darkness for which we were headed. Uh, again, in Amos it said, In that day I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Christ suffered and died so that we could be saved from this judgment and instead live eternally in the light and presence of God. So how do we know it worked? That was the purpose of Christ's death on the cross, to save us from the future and the path that we were on. But how do we know it worked? Well, let's go back to Mark, uh, Mark 15, and this is going to pick up in Scripture from the point on the cross when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And this verse in Mark follows that. When some of those standing nearby heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a spoon with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Remember that the curtain in the temple was not like a flimsy little sheer uh, curtain that you might see in a home today. It was a heavy, thick uh, veil, almost like a wall. And the curtain separated the Holy of Holies, where God's glory, His Shekinah, um, dwelt. And this curtain was there to protect the people from the intense experience of the presence of God. Only the high priest was allowed on one day a year, and it was the high holy day of Yom Kippur, and that was the time of atonement, of um, confession, and reparation through sacrifice and for forgiveness. The curtain itself as it existed said loudly and clearly that it is impossible for anyone sinful, anyone in spiritual darkness to come into God's presence. The tear was God's way of saying from top to bottom, that this sacrifice, this is the sacrifice 
that ends all sacrifices. The way is now open to approach me. Our path that we, of life that humanity was on has been permanently redirected toward God because he paid the price for our sin. <coughs> And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. The first one to approach God was the centurion. He confesses Jesus as the Son of God. Now the Gospel of Mark way back when we first started this, the Gospel of Mark opens with a statement about Jesus, the Son of God. Mark 1, 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So he's, Mark declares it there as he's recording it. Um, the reality of it is, throughout Mark, what we come across is the disciples called him Christ, but did not consider that to be the title for divinity. Um, Christ literally means anointed one, and any human being could be in anointed. So they recognized him as anointed by God, when they called him Christ, but they did not consider him to be divine. Until the centurion's declaration of faith, no one had figured it out. The first person to recognize the divinity of Jesus is the centurion who presided over his death. Now, the only person a loyal Roman would ever call the Son of God was Caesar. And as a centurion, this is a man who more than likely had been hardened by his profession and brutalized, uh, had been capable of brutalizing others. Yet something penetrated his spiritual darkness. He had seen a lot of death and probably inflicted a lot of it. But something happened at the foot of the cross. Now, at this point, the disciples were confused and the religious leaders rejected the idea of Christ, even as the anointed one. They rejected all of that, but not the centurion. Perhaps the light shone through the dying and death of Jesus. It says in the scripture, when he saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. He had seen a lot of death and dying, but Jesus was different. He saw something in Jesus' death that was unlike any other. The tenderness of Jesus must have pierced his darkness. The beauty of Jesus, even in his death, must have flooded his darkness with light. As his death was important uh, and recognized by the centurion, the suffering of Jesus and his death was of immense importance to his followers. They saw Eventually, they saw in his death <clears throat> and in his suffering the greatest act of God's love, power, and justice in history. He suffered and died in order to save us. That is the ultimate proof of his love for us. And in it, there is forgiveness, 
and grace for all. His love will melt our hardness. Um, and next week we will turn to the resurrection. Um, now it's the time for our um, joys and concerns. Um, and right now, everyone seems to be doing pretty good as far as I know. Um, we had been praying for Sherry Miller to um, have good results on her regular cancer checkup. And she told us at Sunday School Sunday that she was cancer free, uh, which was a great joy for all of us. She is still struggling with bronchitis and they have been trying a numerous um, treatments to try to uh, relinquish the hold of bronchitis on her lungs and so we need to continue to pray that she will find healing from that. Um, and we had a great joy, I think I may have mentioned it last week, but We've been praying, and we're going to ask you to continue to pray for the Henderson's uh, great-grandbaby. But some of their treatments are now proving to be successful, and he has taken a few steps. And we rejoice with his family in that and continue to pray for his continued healing and strengthening. Um, and Debbie Meyer is at home and uh, is doing is doing fine and uh, there's there's still a lot of um, work for her to do to regain strength and we will continue to support her with our prayers. Let's have a word of prayer. Good morning Father. We come to you today so grateful for your word so grateful for your love. It's, it's often just unimaginable to us how far your love went, how Christ was willing to suffer and die. And, and in the midst of that experience, a temporary separation from you, and we realize that in all of that, there is this sign of your overwhelming love for us. And we also recognize that there is this obligation as we experience this, your love and we grow in our awareness of it that we share that with others that maybe have not heard or have not experienced you and recognized it. And we choose today to be a part of your work, to be instruments of your love in the world. The needs are great. The suffering in humanity is great. But even in our suffering, we can find some reason to celebrate because it is possible for our suffering to lead us closer to you to transform us more into your likeness. And we pray for that, Father. We pray to become, bit by bit, more like you, more like your plan for us from the beginning. We lift up our joys with Sherry and Ben. We also lift up Donna Miller's friend, Donna Williams' friend, 
Dottie, and we request prayers for her peace and for her healing. And all these things that we come to you with, with all of our praise, with all of our gratitude, with all of our need, Father, and our trust in you, we rejoice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, yeah. So, as we read our closing, so live in the light of the resurrection and renewal of this world and of yourself in a glorious, never-ending, joyful dance of grace. And I will see you next week. <laughs>